The scope of my talk is limited to some raw alloys. Time does not permit me to cover them all. And the fact that I'm not familiar with the cast grades and their applications means that these are also excluded from this presentation. Cast heat-resisting grades are used extensively in many industries, and my omitting them should not be seen as negating their importance. I also exclude things like ceramics, refractories, cermets, and the use of surface modification to achieve corrosion resistance. I think what I should have perhaps also mentioned uh, right at the beginning, but I'll, I'll do so now, it's not too late, is that um, the new stainless steel magazine that's, that's come out, and which I know people have here in Johannesburg. I don't know if it's with people in Durban and Cape Town as well. Yeah. Um, so if they have it, and if you look in the center, there's a, the information series, um, and there's a, there is a whole section, coincidentally, on high temperature uh, stainless steels and alloys. And, and I think it's uh, this format that's, uh, that you have in front of you now as well, um, is most useful. It deals more with also some of the cast materials, which I don't touch on. And it also goes into more technical detail uh, on, on phenomena such as creep and some of the corrosion um, mechanisms that, that I'll touch on. So why have I chosen a topic such as this to, well, I think, John, this is your second uh, technical evening. So why have I chosen high temperature alloys and not something more popular? More, more in vogue, like duplex stainless steels, and and the reason is simple. I normally start off with a hypothetical quote, but this time I've tried. I've, I haven't done that. Um, here, here is an email, an extract from an email I received um, earlier earlier this year, and and this is this is just happens to be the most recent one. But I often get requests such as this. Which, um, which crop up, and it does indicate to me that there is, there is a lack of understanding out there um, with many users, with many people on high temperature alloys, and how, how are they to be used? What's important when looking at high temperature alloys? More often than not, focus is just on temperature, and that's it. And, and the question doesn't, doesn't enter people's mind or they don't put it down when asking the question as to what are the other operating conditions that one needs to take into account. So I think that's what I will try and touch on and illustrate um, today. <laughs> I, I won't answer that. <laughs> okay, so all materials have their limitations. And that includes high temperature alloys intended for use with high temperature as well. Um, and these may include what are the strength at service temperature, so we need to touch on that. It may include uh, corrosion considerations, high temperature corrosion co considerations. It may include the metallurgical and or microstructural stability of the material, um, or a combination of all three of those. And um, I will go through all of them rather briefly, but there are, as I said, more detailed considerations in the in the. Um, oh, you see, I've got to stand still for it. <laughs> it doesn't move automatically. <laughs> um, so there, there are more detailed considerations of some of the the phenomena um, in, in in the the information series. But first of all, we have to start off by defining what do we mean by high temperature. When does low temperature become high temperature? Um, and I think that's, uh, that's an important starting point that we need to, to cover right at the outset. So this is a, a slide that I've taken out of a Sandvik presentation. Okay, so, so um, what it does is it combines a number of, of aspects, um, a number of bits of information. The first thing is it deals with proof strength. And proof strength is typically what one would uh, uh, obtain from a tensile test, which is carried out over a very short period of time. The material is put into tension, um, and the, the point at which deformation starts is recorded as, as the proof strength, or, or in, in steels it would be considered the yield strength. So we, th that diminishes, that drops, it declines very rapidly, 
as temperature increases. But at a point in time, a new phenomenon kicks in, and that's the phenomenon of creep. And there's a good definition of creep in the, uh, in the information series, and I'm just going to read it to you. Um, but it's there. If you haven't got it, it's on the second page. And it says, um, if stainless steel and stainless alloys are subject to loads at high temperature, they will undergo a continuous slow deformation, i.e. plastic strain, and eventually rupture, i.e. break, at stresses below the yield strength as determined in short term in short time testing. So we can see that if the if this uh, yield strength curve had continued, we would anticipate that it would continue going straight almost. However, the new phenomena of creep kicks in and we now face the, the limitation of creep rupture strength. And you can see here, it's indicated just where the red dot is, that this, that was over 10,000 hours. Um, and Or the alternative, the orange line, is over 100,000 hours. So you can see we've introduced a new parameter when talking about creep, and that is time. So essentially, there's the three, three things to consider. It's time, temperature, and the load or stress that's, that's being applied. And that's now an important consideration when we're dealing with materials at high temperature. Very often, the start of a high temperature range is taken at that point where this crossover takes place. So I'm coming back to the, the point I started off with. When, when does low temperature become high temperature? And that's more or less at about the 500 degree centigrade range when creep starts kicking in for the particular types of metals that we, we're going to speak about. That's the, that's the bottom of the range. What's the top of the range? Well, we could say the top of the high temperature range would be the melting point of the material. But of course, what are you going to do with it if it's, if it's reached its melting point? It's not going to be any use to you as a structural material. So we have to be below the melting point. And for most of the, uh, the engineering alloys, or for all of the engineering iron-based, nickel-based, cobalt-based materials that, that you find in, in, in industry, um, 1,200 degrees centigrade is really the upper limit. So, you know, there are metals that will melt at higher temperatures. We've got the refractory metals, for example, but they have other downfalls, and you can't use them in, in all environments can only use them very, very selectively. So if we're going to speak about materials for high temperature, we're going to speak about materials for use in the range more or less between 500 and 1200 degrees centigrade. What are some of the industrial applications that exist uh, in that range? And I just list them here for you. Um, there's, there's galvanizing, for example, uh, in the chemical industry, uh, high temperature, VCM, Production it doesn't occur everywhere. Of course, I think in South Africa we have one plant that uh, that, that that does that. Um, a new a new entrant into the into the high temperature market, so to speak, for 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 South Africa is molten salt storage for concentrating solar power stations. So that's uh, that requires material to handle those molten salts, and that could be a, a, at around. Uh, five to six hundred degrees centigrade. You've got boiler boilers uh, for power generation, um, and and the emphasis is on trying to increase the efficiency of those boilers. And that's done by pushing up the temperatures. Um, you've got carbon regeneration kilns for many many different industries. Molten aluminium in die casting. There's waste incineration. Perhaps not as common here in South Africa as it may be elsewhere in the world, but very often in countries, waste incineration becomes a source of heat, becomes a source of energy for, 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 um, for power generation. Um, so I, I think that's uh, a, a, an important um, uh, uh, high temperature industry, um, but it's one which has got a lot of problems associated with it. As you can imagine, if you're incinerating waste, what are you actually? What's coming off in the gases? Um, you can have gas turbines, either land-based gas turbines, or of course the turbines that that go into aircraft. I mean, they, they are of course um, operating under very stressed 
high temperature conditions. Uh, they need special materials. The firing of bricks, um, depending on the nature of the clay and, and what's being used for the bricks, that, that uh, the temperature range varies quite a, quite a lot. Heat treatment of different metals, and I've just put in here the annealing of an austenitic stainless steel. And Columbus, confirm, do you, is that the temperature you would work with? Somewhere around uh, 1100 degrees centigrade? Yeah? So that's, you know, you've got to be able to have metals that can withstand that sort of temperature uh, in the furnace, if that's what you're heat treating at. Or, uh, heat treating in, in, in a surface modification process like carburizing and then going back to the chemical industry, nitric acid production, uh, also in the chemical industry, ethylene production, in the minerals processing industry, copper mat smelting. So copper mat, for those who don't know, it has a high level of sulfur in it. And so you, you're generating a lot of sulfur fumes in that environment. And that gives rise to, to, to tremendous problems if you don't have the right alloy. Um, just to put in there, because of the question of what you do above 1200 degrees centigrade, um, and, and uh, cemented carbide sintering is a case in point. When you manufacture cemented carbides, you need to sinter them. That's done at about 1400. And molybdenum is used in that sort of application. So a refractory metal is used, but it can only be used in a hydrogen in a reducing or an inert atmosphere. So that's, that's where it's, it has to be done. You can't do it in, in an open atmosphere or in, or in vacuum, of course. Um, I see I've left brick firing in there again. Uh, ceramic tile firing is done at very high temperatures. And those, you'll have metal rollers in many of those kilns uh, where, where the, the, the tiles move across those metal rollers. And if you've got off gases in ferro-alloy furnaces, typically they could be coming off at temperatures like 1300 to 1500 degrees centigrade. And of course, you, you can't just put that into, a, uh, into, into metal without cooling the metal in some way. So that would have to go through some sort of cooled handling system. So that's just an overview of some of the industrial processes that one might come across at high temperature. What metals are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk about iron-based materials. And the first group I put in there are what we often just refer to as pressure vessel steels or boilerplate. And there's a wide range of them. There's many of them. But they represent the start of what is a continuum of materials that, that get used for high temperatures. And, and, and materials like uh, AA516 grade 70, um, you know, is often asked for, or, and, and other are there similar materials to the EN standards or the BS standards? Um, and I'm not going to go into detail, but they represent the start of the high temperature range of, of materials. What I'm going to start off with, in fact, is the stainless steels, where we've got ferritic stainless steels and then the austenitic stainless steels. And again, I'm not going to go into a great deal of reviewing each one of them. Um, but it will come out during the course of the, of the presentation. In addition to iron-based or stainless steels or steels, you've got nickel-based materials. And, and they are often used, you know, we, we have terms like, uh, you know, inconel, inkaloy, often bandied about. They represent the higher nickel-containing materials. But what is the role of nickel uh, when one starts adding it into, into, into an iron base? Um, if one starts adding it into, into an iron-based uh, metal. Firstly, nickel itself has a high capacity for alloying. You can put a lot of other alloying elements into, into nickel, and, and that means you, you have a good starting point for, 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 for creating a new alloy. It has resistance to attack by carbon. It has resistance to attack by halogens like chlorine chlorides, fluorine fluorides. It has resistance to, to, to complexing or forming nitrides. But it also helps improve the stability of an oxide on the metal surface. So that would be the role of, of nickel in the metal. <clears throat> Often in, in nature, one finds cobalt present with nickel. So you might have a bit of cobalt carry over into the metal. But if cobalt is added deliberately into the alloy, um, it has the role of enhancing strength. Um, and also at the same time of 
of overcoming one of the limitations of nickel, and that's it's nickel has a poor resistance to attack by sulfur. And so if you have cobalt there, or as a partial substitute, it over may be used to overcome that, that problem. We spoke about, I mentioned that we need to take into account strength criteria at high temperature. And we've, we've mentioned the phenomena of creep, of creep. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail. But how does one generate resistance to creep? In, in the metal? What do you do? What do you add into the metal to, to enhance its resistance to, to, to creep? And, and there are different ways in which these, these elements function, but I've listed them there. Firstly, you can have just carbon and nitrogen in the material. They get dissolved interstitially in the atomic structure, in other words, between all the, all the other bigger atoms, um, and they, they, in that way, um, perform a function of, of increasing creep resistance. Similarly, you can replace some of those big atoms um, with, with, uh, with, with bigger atoms. And that's right at the bottom. That would be solid solution strengthening. And that would be by using elements such as tungsten and molybdenum. And, and these are used extensively in, in many high temperature alloys. Um, alternatively, you can add elements into the material which will form new precipitates in the metal. And you get a precipitate forming, and it's that precipitate which then enhances the strength. And to do that, to get those precipitates to form, you may use things like aluminium, titanium, uh, uh, niobium, and, and, and copper. So as you can see, there's a wide range of different elements that may be added into, into a base material to form higher strength alloys. And very often it's not one or other, but several of them that, that go into, into the alloy. And it's worth mentioning at this stage that the, the, the higher the strength of the alloy at high temperatures, the more difficult it is to manufacture, because you need to roll it. You need to roll it at high temperatures. So if it's got higher strength, you know, can you do it? And that's, that becomes a, you know, a, a real problem in manufacture, and also, of course, adds to the cost of manufacture and the cost of these alloys. So let's just look a little bit at the, street, at the creep phenomena. And here we're not looking at creep rupture. In other words, not the point at which it breaks, but to the point at which it deforms by 1% in 10,000 hours. Okay, so 10,000 hours is about how long in what would we know it as? Uh, any idea? Maybe 40? 42? No? 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 Did I put a north somewhere wrong in my calculation? I got it as 14 months. So it's yeah, 400 days. Right. So you can imagine to generate data on different materials um, as they as they emerge to monitor these materials, their consistency. Tests are being conducted over that period of time. You know, 100,000 hours. 14 months approximately. And that's not the end because, you know, sometimes they want not, not 10,000 hours, they want 100,000 hours. So that's now, you know, 140 months. Uh, so it's, it's long-term testing. But just to start off with looking at the creep rate in 10,000 hours, the first metal mentioned there is just a, 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 a chrome moly uh, engineering steel. You can see the value, 304, 321, 316Ti, and 310S. And the reason I've built up to this point is to illustrate a point. And that point is that if we think about high-temperature stainless steels, what do we think about? 310S. But as you can see, from a strength point of view, from a creep strength point of view, it may not be the optimum. And if, if, if there's design considerations that require higher strength, but you can sacrifice something on the oxidation or resistance side maybe, then you can look at an alternative such as one of the stabilized grades like 321 and 316i. And, and it, it has, I've come across applications where that, where that has been done. So it's worthwhile just bearing that in mind. 
The other thing to note is how quickly the the strength drops off. The the creep rate, uh, the, the, the 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 stress to cause one percent creep drops off with temperature. So you can see that very quickly for for any of the the metals concerned, it drops off in 200 degrees centigrade. It drops by by, by 75 percent almost, and maybe even more with the 310s. Uh, it, it it drops very rapidly. One of the things about creep data is that one must always consider it as typical. It's never a guaranteed minimum value. It's always typical, and, and a factor of safety may even have to be applied to that. It's, it's data which, if you extract it from various sources, you may actually come up with different values. Um, and that's why, you know, this, technically this should be referenced so that you know where it comes from, so you can actually go back to to some of those those sources. But in uh, for 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 this, I can tell you it came out of the Columbus Data Book. I don't know where you, where, where you guys got it from, but but there you are. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's uh, moving on to other alloys. I've just put three or four back in there, and three to one, um, just uh, for comparison purposes. Um, and this is now at 760 degrees centigrade, so it's not directly comparable with the previous table. Why have I jumped around a little bit? Because that's where I could find data on other materials, such as 253MA, which is also a, uh, a lower nickel stainless steel, but with modifications to it. Uh, alloy 800HT, which is uh, moving towards the nickel alloy range, and your alloy 601 which is a, a nickel alloy that has a small amount of um, aluminium in it. So I think that's um, just to indicate the range, or a typical range of, of um, the creep rate uh, for a broader spectrum of materials. And to move on still further, um, but here we're talking about creep rupture now. So now we're talking about the point at which fracture occurs. And here I've introduced the material 1.4742, which is really a ferritic stainless steel, a high temperature ferritic stainless steel, um, which can be used ferritic. It has no nickel in it, and that has certain advantages and is often used um, because of those advantages. But at the end of the day, uh, you can see it doesn't have a, a, a high uh, creep strength. And then you've got the 253MA again, 310, and two nickel alloys, uh, alloy 625, and, and, and your alloy 601. Right, we're moving off the strength aspect, and we're now going to talk about resistance to chemical attack at high temperatures. And essentially what you want to do is form a metal oxide film, um, which is stable, uh, and, and, and it adheres to the surface. And at the same time, uh, it protects the metal from, from gaseous attack. And two, 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 uh, two ways of achieving this um, come into play. The first is to get the state of the oxide film to form in the first place. And there one adds into the metal what are known as oxide formers. And chromium is the, the most obvious one when we talk about stainless steel. But in addition to that, you've got silicon and aluminium. They can be added to, 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 to help form that oxide, that protective layer. In addition to that, now, we want that layer, that layer, that protective layer to adhere to the surface. And the way that's normally done is by the addition or to enhance that, that, that uh, adhesion to the surface uh, is by, by using rare earths but you can see them listed there as well. So, for example, a material like 253MA, and there are others, would, would have the addition of CE into the material. Um, and that does help that oxide layer uh, stay in place and, 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 not, uh, and not peel off or, or, or spall off. So... Just to illustrate this in a little bit more detail, I don't know how clearly it comes out around the coast, but the, the little figure which has chrome, silicon, and aluminium under it does the scale 
does is, is shaded slightly differently. And that's really to illustrate that the nature of that scale changes with the addition of silicon and aluminium. And it's that change that comes about that creates a more protective layer in, uh, to, to the metal underneath. It's okay, good. Thank you. So, ideally, what we're looking for in air is an, a protective layer that will be self repairing, it will be adherent, and it won't be porous. And if one can achieve that, then you'll have a good high temperature alloy. In air, it's a lot easier to do than, of course, in, in other uh, gases, in, in other environments where, where a range of reactions may take place. Just to speak about the breakdown of the film, um, and in metals we have to understand that if we're talking about an oxide film on the surface and the metal underneath, we actually have two similar materials in contact. And they will expand and contract at different rates. They will flex, they will yield at different rates. So if, your, if your metal itself is going to be subjected to thermal cycling for any reason, in other words, it's going in and out of a furnace, that's the thermal cycling, you could have that oxide spalling off. Uh, or alternatively, if it's going to be loaded and unloaded over a period, over in, in cycles, again, you will find that that oxide may spall off. And hence, the emphasis on trying to make sure you've got an adherent oxide uh, so that, that that doesn't occur. Just to illustrate this point graphically, uh, the blue line shows you what might happen with a protective layer um, over time, it will, you, the sample, the test piece will gain weight, which shows the oxide is forming as the weight gains, uh, and, and, but it will stabilize and it won't continue uh, uh, increasing in weight because that, that oxide just reaches a certain level and, and, and stays there. On the other hand, the black line is if that oxide is non-protective, the weight gain will continue over, over, over time. And in between the red line, we've got a situation where spalling takes place. So you can see that the sample gains weight, a little piece of the oxide spalls off, so the weight it loses weight, it gains weight again, a piece falls off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that would be a, 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 a case where once the, the, the protective layer has spalled off, the gases that are or the gases or liquids that are present can then get to the fresh metal surface and so the reaction will, will continue. Okay, let's look at the situation now. If What happens if you've got sulfur present? I think the, the situation with sulfur, and it could be sulfur in the reducing circumstances, i.e. where there's not much oxygen present, or sulfur in an oxidizing situation. And under those situations, one is, faces a problem with many alloys that even contain nickel, but certainly if they contain a significant amount of nickel. Um, uh, and, and one has to then just, a red flag has got to come up, and one's just got to exercise caution. Um, essentially what happens is it's a mechanism similar to oxidation, in other words, you will get a sulfide forming instead of an oxide forming. You'll get a metal sulfide forming. But the problem is that the sulfides have lower melting temperatures than the oxides. So the, the, the nickel sulfides in particular can start melting in their own right. But what happens more particularly with sulfidation is that nickel sulfide and nickel form a low melting point eutectic. So you start finding that the metal could start appearing to melt in front of your eyes, or actually melting, uh, although it's not the metal that's melting, it's the, it's, it's, it's the compound, the nickel eutectic that's melting, uh, at, at temperatures as low as, as 600 or 700 degrees centigrade. Um, it all depends on what the gaseous atmosphere is in com combination with the sulfur, how much nickel is in the material to be able to say precisely, but at the end of the day, it, it, it does happen. And it's in those circumstances where one wants to avoid nickel in the material 
and, and move to something like a, a, a ferritic uh, high temperature stainless steel. <coughs> We move away from, from sulfur now, and we talk now more about carbonaceous environments. And certainly, carbonation in environments can be very complex um, and, and, uh, and are wide ranging. Uh, the burning of any, any coal, any oil, any uh, uh, natural gases um, are going to give rise to carbon, carbonaceous environments. And, and depending on how complex they are, what the nature of the the environment is what the um, the other um, uh, uh, elements, uh, the other compounds present. For example, is there steam present, um, and, and does that steam break down? That will all have a big influence on on the nature of the the attack that 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 may may take place. But essentially, if there's carbon present and you've got chromium there, as, as we do have in stainless steels and many of the high temperature alloys. What, what may occur is the formation of carbides in the material. And a particular high temperature problem is known as metal dusting. I'm going to focus on that as opposed to just carbide formation because it just illustrates uh, both of them in a more, how could I say, in a more holistic way. Carbon diffuses into the metal. The metal becomes saturated with carbon and carbides that form. Powdery carbon or carbides form, and as a consequence of that, if they form around the grain, that metal particle can then fall out. You actually get metal particles being produced. And the fact that you have the carbon and, car and, and metal particles there in the first place catalyze the reaction. They make the reaction continue. And so to resist this form of, of, of gaseous attack, of, of, of high temperature attack, one needs an adherent, protective, healable oxide surface layer, and you need a high level of scale formers. And it has been found in more recent times that something like copper does play a role in, in retarding the actual reaction the, uh, of, of, of metal dusting. So it's a very complex phenomenon. It's becoming more common uh, to my way of thinking, in, 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 in the last decade or so, with the use of, of other sources of, uh, of, ga of, of, um, of fuel, like, like natural gas. Um, and I think they're finding that in, in, in those circumstances, metal dusting is becoming more of a problem to deal with, and a lot of research has been going into it. I'm not going to go through all the environments in detail, but really to summarize it, let's just look at what happens in waste incineration. So in waste, you could have, um, you could have moisture, so you're, that, that breaks down into hydrogen and, and oxygen. You've got nitrogen then from the air. You could have carbonaceous compounds. You could have sulfur compounds coming off from, from other natural products. And of course, you could have chlorides and fluorides from plastic if one is incinerating them at the same time. And they create a very complex environment which will require metals that are almost custom designed for waste incineration applications. It's not your ordinary stainless steel, your 310s or your 253 MAs that, that may work in those applications. One might have to go to an extreme alloy one which contains quite a lot of cobalt in it, in fact. Let's just round off the question of high temperature attack by talking about, about the attack, not from the gaseous atmosphere, but from liquids, from molten compounds. And there's two circumstances to consider. The one is molten metals, such as with galvanizing, or with aluminium, lead, copper, uh, a couple of years ago, I came across there's a project going on which involved liquid magnesium. And that was an, an interesting situation because the, there was a problem with nickel in the metal. Um, if it was a ferritic stainless steel, it was fine. But if there's nickel in the metal, uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 it caused alloying with the magnesium. So those could be typical circumstances. And there again, one has to choose the most appropriate alloy. It's not a question of saying which one is, is the right one, 
uh, there's uh, ferritic stainless steels work well with uh, with molten copper, for example. Uh, for 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 galvanizing, you can use a a low silicon iron galvanizing bars. You don't need you don't need an exotic material in actual fact. Um, so it, there are standard materials that have been identified. But I just want to illustrate that that could be a circumstance where where where, where high temperature attack does take place, and that's with with molten metal. And then one gets molten salts. For example, we mentioned the salts used in CSP uh, concentrating solar uh, plants um, for for energy storage. Um, but there are other circumstances where molten salts are, are also arise. Sometimes they arise without intention. For example, um, heavy fuel oil, which might be burnt, uh, contains vanadium, and you might get vanadium slags that form. And that those slags, those molten slags that form, react with the metal oxide and actually have a an effect of dissolving the metal oxide, which you want there for protection, may be dissolved away, and a, and a reaction occurs as a consequence of that. So I think that's just what I wanted to touch on as far as high temperature corrosion. Um, it's something to take into account, and hence the question: you know, what is the temperature, or can I use Alloy X at temperature 900, 1000 degrees centigrade is an insufficient information. One needs to know a lot more. I think if I could just pause at this point and say, to some extent, I think the data that's generated leads to that sort of question because the data that's generated gives an upper temperature limit. Uh, or, sorry, not data that's generated, data that's published. Uh, gives an upper temperature limit for different materials. But there in small print, and it is there, it does say in oxidizing environments. People don't often see that, and hence they don't focus on that aspect of it, uh, that it's only in oxidizing environments, and that if the environment's not oxidizing, you need to, 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 to go back to square one and, and look at the problem again. Okay, managing aging plants. Um, and it sounds a little bit like uh, like a geriatrician, but but at, at the end of the day, this is becoming a more well known, a more common discipline in in in, in engineering industry, in the chemical industry, because many plants out there um, have been around for many years, and the question arises: How do we keep them going? Um, what's happened to them while they have been operating. We've spoken about creep. Um, you know, creep is a time phenomenon. We now have plants that have been operating for many years. What's happened to the metal uh, in, 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 during, during this, this period? And the, the discipline of managing aging plants, um, you know, focuses on things like safety, rel re reliability, material integrity and failures. And so it's taking into account some of the, the things that we've been, been touching on. But what it does do is it makes us think a lot more about what's happening inside the metal itself. And this is just an illustrative curve. It's actually a series of curves for duplex stainless steel to show the effect of temperature on the precipitation of phases in, in the material. High temperature materials would actually have a totally different set of curves to illustrating the phases that, that maybe may appear over time. Um, but nonetheless, it's important to know because these, these, these changes that take place can change the, the mechanical properties of the material, particularly by embrittling it. And, 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 and that in its own right can, can give rise to, to, to serious problems. Again, the topic is handled perhaps in more detail um, in, in the handout in the SASTA publication where things like um, 475 degree embrittlement is, is mentioned, sigma phase. Um, but there, as you can see here, um, when one's dealing with the more complex alloys, there's many other phenomena that take place. It's not just those two. And one needs to, to just be aware of them. Just, just know that materials that have been subjected to high temperature for a period of time may have become embrittled and their properties may, may have changed. And that's, that's important to know. I just wanted to 
Let me go back a minute. I just want to end off with a um, um, three three examples of problems that we've encountered over over many years. There's many more, but uh, these happen to be three which came to hand fairly quickly. These uh, the first one is what I refer to as a muscle tube, and and what ha it's a 310 pipe. Um, inside it is, is a gas is passed to uh, to, to provide a protective environment. Um, the outside of the pipe is heated to about 1100, 1150 degrees centigrade. Um, it's heated electronically, uh, electrically, electrical heating. Um, and through the center of the tube, a, a wire is passed. So essentially what it's doing is the wire is being annealed at that, at that temperature. Um, and, and we got a call having customer having used the 310 pipe successfully for some time, we got a call to say our, our tubes are failing. And what's happening to them, they're actually melting. So I thought, ah, at long last, my first case of sulfidation. I can, uh, we've got an example of sulfur attack of, of, of the metal. Sulfur attack, as I mentioned to you, reduces the melting point of the metal. And if it wasn't sulfur attack reducing the melting point, the only other thing that could have happened was that the temperature control was totally awry. And the metal, the temperature of 1100 wasn't 1100. It was 1300 or 1400 or 1500 or whatever. Um, but the client assured us that wasn't the case. So uh, we checked for sulfur and there was no sulfur to be found anywhere. Anyway, a little while later, the customer admitted to investigating the problem their side and having found that their temperature control instrumentation was, was on the blink. So it wasn't, in fact, anything wrong with, with, with the 310. It was, in fact, just pure overheating. But it does go to show that, you know, sometimes don't overlook the obvious. Uh, you know, when one is confronted with a problem like this, you know, it might just be the obvious. Second case was uh, uh, about two or three years ago, and 310 being used, with the pyrolysis of organics, organic uh, waste. Pyro pyrolysis, uh, if you look at the definition, says that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a thermal reaction carried out in the absence of oxygen. So you can understand that you know, it could be damaging to materials that require to have oxygen for, 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 for protection. The problem in this instance was Firstly, that wasn't at a very high temperature, so one thought, well, maybe you could get away with, with, with it. But secondly, um, it was a pilot plant, and this is this is the, the, what, what arises in you know real life. You know, the guy wants to build a pilot plant. What does he do? He can't he can't afford to put it up with, with some of the more specialised materials. Regrettably, he this this a lesson was learned uh, in this case. In a, in a very short space of time. The material wasted away, you can see it, it's not quite as easy to see, but you can see there the material is totally thinned. Um, and it was probably something like a, uh, um, a metal dusting type phenomenon, or something that, that occurred in the material. We didn't investigate it to, to that detail, but, uh, and, and to the point that it just, just cracked away, it just broke away. And last but not least is just a mention on, on ferritic materials, ferritic high temperature alloys. It's a problem we, we've run into where these materials, um, you know, Professor Google, Mr. Google, Dr. Google tells you they're available. And they're available all over the place. Um, but you can burn one's fingers with, with this type of material because they're not easy materials to, to manufacture. And, and one needs to just be cautious uh, uh, on where you obtain them and the quality of the materials you, you obtain. Because we found ourselves in a situation where we, we imported plates and it had in it uh, cracks, as you can see, because ferritic stainless steels are well known for being quite brittle materials, um, as well as inclusions, uh, as well as carbides. So, as a result of that, you know, we paid school fees. But it's important to know that the right material is available if you need it, 
um, and 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 we discovered that second time round. Okay, any questions? Uh, yeah. No questions. No. Okay. Good. There was a question from KZN, okay. and they wanted you to comment on um, intermittent versus continuous temperature and what the impact of that is. Okay, well, I, I think my, my first thought that comes about is is the intermittent temperature, uh, in other words, the effect of thermal cycling, um, is going to give rise to expansion and contraction of the of the metal, which in its own right is going to give rise to 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 then the possibility of any protective layers falling off. Um, in terms of the 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 metallurgical structure uh, of of the metal itself. Um, I'm not 100% sure, you know, I, I can comment, I don't know enough about it. Uh, it you know, metallurgical changes are time, temperature de dependent, so if the, if, if the time at that temperature changes, um, you know, the phenomena wouldn't, wouldn't increase. But you might be getting more complex phases being pre precipitated and dissolved, re-precipitated, making it even more, more damaging for, for, for the material. Um, last but not least, is if there's if it's intermittent temperature, um, you do have the situation that maybe the other there are other process conditions changing. For example, um, you know if you've got a situation where you've got sulfur gases at high temperature um, and you you're dealing with it quite well, um, but then the temperature drops to below room temperature, uh, it drops that low. Uh, and you then get below the dew point, and you actually get sulfuric or sulfurous acid forming. You now have another problem. Uh, it's no longer a high temperature problem, but you, you could have a corrosion problem uh, overlapping that. Uh, I, I don't know if that, that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, Angie, you can, you can talk if you want a question. Yeah. I'm going to ask on the last slide that you showed, the, the ferritic, the 1.4742. So the cracks are called. Okay, how thick was the plate? How, how, how thick was the plate? And then the cracks was due to the carbides. No, the cracks were due to the quality problem. I found that it was due to the carbides. I think they were. It was. I think it was due to the manufacturing process more than the carbides. I have to say, when we investigate these these things, we we do that um, uh, just to find out if it's a material quality problem. Rather than understand the full phenomena, if you want the samples, I got them for you. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to investigate it, by all means. But uh, um, we, you know, we didn't want to go into too much detail. We just wanted to pinpoint, uh, you know, what we were being told by the user. Um, you know, was it defective material? And it turned out, yeah, you know, we had to accept it was. Whether it was just carbides or, 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 or some other rolling phenomena in manufacture, I can't comment. But it was there were cracks in the in the material away from the sheared edges. Okay, but the yes, Ken. They don't pick you up. <laughs> Ken, uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, you know, I thought I knew a little bit about stainless steels at high temperatures. I think I've, I've uh, sort of realised I actually didn't know very much. So thank you. I think it was fantastic. Um, just one of the things that is probably not really related to a lot of the technology of high temperature applications in the real sense of the word but it's it's i think it's becoming more and more important is the short term elevated temperature properties of many of these alloys and and we see that i think in in the architectural applications where fire is becoming a, a, an increasingly complicated environment and you know the, the fact that stainless steels can offer fantastic um resistance to temperature at Elevated temperatures, um, you know, the, the mechanical properties are really great. I think that's probably going to be one of the bigger applications of stainless steels and high alloy steels in the future. Great. Thank you, Ken. And version two of my talk will make sure to include that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, were, were there any other questions? Yeah? Just hold on. Otherwise, we won't hear.
Yeah. Um, on the second case that you uh, investigated, not the one with the muffled tubes, the other one where you said the guy was using 310, and you mentioned that it was probably not the best alloy to use in that application. Uh, w which one did you uh, advise him to so, use in that? Well, sorry, in, sorry. The end, uh, sorry. <laughs> in the end, sorry. Uh, sorry. In the end, the whole the whole project had to had to be abandoned. Um, one of the one of the reasons is, that, and and I think it's it's it's, it's a practical issue. Um, you know, waste to energy is an interesting and important uh, um, field for particularly for us um, in in South Africa. Even though we might be a, we have enough electricity in the future, but it's certainly a field that that's of growing importance around the world and where a lot of work is, is done. But but very often it's done in by people and in places and environments where the capital resources needed to to actually invest and investigate fully um, aren't aren't there. So so what what would have been a better choice in in all likelihood and the point that's the point I'm coming to would have been one of the higher nickel alloys. You know, your Inconel, Incoloy, Alloy 600 type materials. Uh, that may have been, been a better choice. Even though the temperature is not very high. Um, I'm not sure. We didn't really look at 253 MA at, the, at that point in time, although it was probably quoted to the customer. And I'm not sure what, what, what the reason was. That might also have been an, another alternative, simply because of the nature of that, that oxide. A better option would have been to have had some sort of test work done with that particular waste to, to evaluate what would have been the optimum material. But it wasn't possible. A decision was made to build the pilot plant, and, 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 and as it turned out, it, it didn't work out.